So today we will be <coughs> discussing the third chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. This chapter is called Karma Yoga. In the beginning of this chapter, Arjuna asks a question from Krishna. Why do you want me to fight in this battle if performing devotional service is better than performing pious and impious activities? I am confused by your ambiguous instructions. Please tell me decisively which will be most beneficial for me. Now, let us try to understand what were the ambiguous instructions given by Krishna in the previous chapter. In the first half of the previous chapter, Krishna explained the difference between the soul and the body and convinced Arjuna that it is Arjuna's duty to fight in a Dharma Yuddha as a Kshatriya. Now, the understanding underlying this instruction is that a person is the soul, not the body. The soul is indestructible, whereas the body is always perishable. The soul does not die when the body dies. Therefore, Arjuna need not lament for the loss of the body. Now, in the second half of the previous chapter, Krishna elaborately described buddhi yoga or devotional service. Krishna advised Arjuna to keep away all pious and impious activities simply by performing devotional service. Now, Arjuna is confused whether he should fight in the battle or refrain from fighting by doing devotional service. Now in response to this question by Arjuna, Krishna elaborately explains Karma Yoga in this third chapter. The nature of this world is such that every action that we perform has got something called a reaction. Now, People generally perform two kinds of activities, pious activities and sinful activities, punya and papa. You might have heard the name punya and papa. Pious activities result in uh, good reactions or enjoyment and sinful actions result in bad reactions or suffering. To experience reactions, one is bound to accept a body because it is through the body only we experience any enjoyment or suffering. And that leads to repetition of birth and death. Therefore, to conquer birth and death and to become free from material bondage, one should become free from all reactions. Now, Lord Krishna says, in the beginning of explaining this Karma Yoga, He says, simply by avoiding work, one cannot become free from reactions. Because if I do some work, I get some reaction. So let me not do any work. Krishna says, no. You cannot become free from reactions simply by not working. Why? Why does Krishna say this? This is because, Everyone is forced to work helplessly according to the qualities a person has acquired from nature. No one can refrain from doing something, not even for a single moment. That means everyone in this world is always active. Now somebody may think, what about lazy people? They don't do anything. They simply sit in one place. How do you say everyone is always active? We have to understand activities can be performed through the body, through
through words or even through the mind. So a person may be lazy, so he may not be physically active. He may even be not talking or speaking. He may be sitting silently. But the mind is always working. Therefore, no one can be uh, situated without doing some work all the time. One may try to restrain his senses of action. One may try to stop activity while his mind is engaged in sense enjoyment. Such a person, Krishna says, is certainly deluding himself and such a person is called as a pretender. <coughs> that means he has not really controlled his senses. Because above the senses there is the mind and that mind is engaged in sense enjoyment. Therefore, <clears throat> Lord Krishna instructs that we should perform our prescribed duty uh, for doing so is better than not working. One cannot even maintain one's physical body without doing some work. Now Lord Krishna next explains the method of working without getting bound up by reactions. He says that work should be done as sacrifice to Vishnu. Therefore, one has to work for the satisfaction of Vishnu. Any work done in this world, which is not done as sacrifice to Vishnu, will be a cause for bondage. Because both good and evil works have their reactions. And any reaction binds the performer. Therefore, one has to work in Krishna consciousness to satisfy Lord Vishnu. And while performing such activities as devotional service or in Krishna consciousness, one is in a liberated stage free from all reactions. Next, Lord Krishna describes the position of the devotees. He says, the devotees are released from all kinds of sinful reactions because they eat food which is first offered for sacrifice. Others who prepare food simply for some personal enjoyment, they are eating only sin. Now, what is the link between food, sacrifice and Lord Vishnu? That is explained as a cycle of sacrifice. What is the cycle of sacrifice? Krishna says, all living bodies subsist on food grains. This is not difficult to understand. Uh, to maintain our body, we have to eat. Now, food grains are produced from rains. Rains are produced by performance of sacrifice. And sacrifice is born of prescribed duties. Prescribed duties are mentioned in the Vedas. And Vedas are directly given by Lord Vishnu. Therefore, Lord Vishnu is always present in all sacrifices. See the link? We started with food grains. Food grains are connected with rains. Because without rains you cannot produce any food grains. Rains are connected to yajna or sacrifice. Only if somebody does sacrifice there will be rains. Sacrifices 
are born of prescribed duties. Prescribed duty. Duty means something which is given to you. Now, where are they prescribed? Prescribed duties are prescribed in the Vedas. The Vedas are directly given by Lord Vishnu at the beginning of the creation. Therefore, Lord Vishnu is always present in all acts of sacrifice. Now, to understand this, <clears throat> the presence of Lord Vishnu in sacrifices, what does it mean? It is explained that Lord Vishnu or Krishna is the personal beneficiary of all sacrifices. He is also the master of all devatas who serve him as different limbs of the body serve the whole body. Devatas like Indra, Chandra, Vayu, Varuna, there are so many. All of them are appointed officers to manage material affairs and the Vedas direct sacrifices to satisfy these devatas so that the devatas may be pleased to supply water, air, light, which are all required to produce food grains. Now when Lord Krishna is worshipped, the devatas who are all different limbs of the Supreme Lord Krishna, they are automatically worshipped. Therefore, for a devotee who is engaged in worshipping Krishna, there is no need to separately worship the devatas. For this reason, the devotees of the Lord who are in Krishna consciousness, they offer food to Lord Krishna and then only eat the remnants of such offering. This process nourishes the body, nourishes the mind and also nourishes the soul. By such action, what happens? Not only are the past sinful reactions completely destroyed, but the body becomes immunized to all contamination of material nature. To help us understand this principle, there is an example given. Just like when there is an epidemic disease, an antiseptic vaccine protects the person from the attack of the epidemic. Just like now, there is so much uh, risk of coronavirus. Unfortunately, we don't have a vaccine. If we had a vaccine, we would just have taken the vaccine and we would have been immunized. Hmm? Similarly, it is explained that food offered to Lord Krishna and then taken by us makes us sufficiently resistant to all material infection. And one who is accustomed to this practice is called a devotee of the Lord. Therefore, a person in Krishna consciousness who eats only food which is offered to Krishna can counteract all reactions of past material infections, which are impediments to progress in self-realization. On the other hand, one who does not do so, that means one who simply eats food without doing any offering to Krishna, such a person increases the volume of sins and thus prepares his next body to resemble dogs and hogs. That means he degrades himself from the human form of life to take birth in lower species because he has to suffer the resultant reactions of his sinful life. Now the material world is full of contamination and one who is immunized by accepting food offered to Krishna is saved from material infection. Whereas one who does not do so becomes subjected to material infection. If we have to work for the satisfaction of Lord Vishnu, 
How can we do so? It is said that we should find the direction of work in the Vedas. The Vedas are therefore described as working code for uh, people in general. Anything performed without the direction of the Vedas is called unauthorized work or sinful work. Therefore, one should always take directions from the Vedas and be saved from reactions to work. <clears throat> Anybody wants to become free from material bondage, they should work in such a way that they don't get any reaction due to the work. So what kind of work should be done? Work should be done as directed in the Vedas. As one has to work in ordinary life by the directions of the state, similarly one has to work under direction of the supreme state of the supreme lord by referring to the Vedas. The different sacrifices which a person should perform are mentioned in the Vedas. But these sacrifices are not easy to perform in this present age. Therefore, the Vedas recommend performance of sacrifice of chanting the holy name of Lord Krishna in this present age. This is called Sankirtan Yajna. Next, Lord Krishna describes what is the position of a self-realized soul. Why is it important to understand this? Because the purpose of performing our duties as sacrifice to Vishnu is to become free from bondage and ultimately attain self-realization. This is the goal of life. People do not know. What is the ultimate goal of life? Ultimate goal of life is self-realization. But if one is already self-realized, then it is explained by Lord Krishna in this chapter that such a person has no obligation for performing any duties. Duties are meant for people who want to become free from bondage and get self-realization. But if a person is already self-realized, he has no obligation to perform duties. Lord Krishna gives the example of King Janaka. He says, kings such as Janaka attain perfection by performance of prescribed duties. Now why would Janaka, who was a self-realized soul, Maharaj Janaka, why would he perform any duties? That is explained that even though he was already self-realized, Maharaj Janaka because he was the king of Mithila, he had to teach his subjects how to fight righteously in battle. He and his subjects fought to teach people in general that violence is also necessary in a situation where good arguments fail. Now, see Arjuna's situation. Before the battle of Kurukshetra, every effort was made to avoid this battle. Even Supreme Lord Krishna tried to negotiate for peace. But the other party, that is the party of Duryodhana, was determined to fight. So for such a right cause, there is a necessity of fighting. Although one who is situated in Krishna consciousness may not have any interest in this world, but still, he performs his duties simply to teach the general people how to live and how to act in this world. Therefore, Krishna says, just for the sake of educating the common people, one should perform his prescribed duties, even though he may be a self-realized soul and there may be no need for him to perform any duties. Next, Krishna 
explains a general principle. He says, whatever action a great man performs, common men follow. And whatever standards he sets by exemplary acts, all the world pursues. This is a very important lesson for us. What is that lesson to be learned from this general principle that Krishna is stating here? People in general always require a leader who can teach the public by practical behavior. A leader cannot teach the public to stop smoking if he himself smokes. Therefore, Lord Chaitanya said, that a teacher should behave properly even before he begins to teach. One who teaches by his personal example is called Acharya or the ideal teacher. Therefore, a teacher must follow the principles of Vedas to teach the common people. In our society, it is explained that the king or the executive head of state, the father, the school teacher, all of them are considered to be natural leaders of the innocent public. All such natural leaders have a great responsibility to their dependents. Therefore, they must be conversant with standard books of moral and spiritual codes. So we understand that the natural leaders in our society should be conversant with the Vedic directions. Otherwise, they cannot play the role of being the leaders. Now, Lord Krishna concludes his instruction to Arjuna on Karma Yoga by stating, Therefore, Arjuna... Surrendering all your works unto me, with full knowledge of me, without desire for profit, with no claims to proprietorship, free from lethargy, fight. Arjuna asked, decisively tell me whether I should fight or not. Krishna's conclusion is, you should fight. But here, very clearly it is explain as stated by Krishna in what consciousness Arjuna should engage in his duty of fighting. The consciousness is very important. What is the consciousness Arjuna should have for doing this duty of fighting? He should be surrendering all his works to Krishna. That's exactly what Karma Yoga is. That's how Karma Yoga frees one from bondage, material bondage. With full knowledge of who is Krishna. Krishna is the enjoyer of all sacrifices. All sacrifices are meant to satisfy Krishna. And Arjuna should do this duty of fighting without desiring any profit for himself. Why? Because if somebody desires any gain from his work or from his duty, then he becomes bound up. Therefore, Arjuna should do his duty without desire for profit, with no claims to proprietorship. Hmm? Proprietorship over any action doesn't belong to the person who is acting or working. Because we should know that we are always controlled we are never uh, fully independent. Though we have some degree of independence, we are ultimately controlled. Controlled by the Supreme Lord, hmm? Supreme Lord Vishnu or Krishna. Therefore, without claiming any proprietorship, free from lethargy. Lethargy means sometimes people feel lazy, so that they don't do their prescribed duties. They don't do their duties. So that also Krishna says, uh, you should not be lethargic 
and thereby avoid doing your duty. You must do your duty. Uh, and that duty has uh, been specified in the case of Arjuna that he must fight. Because Arjuna's question was, should I fight or should I not fight? So Krishna is clearly telling, you must fight. And Krishna gives a general instruction that persons who execute their duties according to Krishna's injunctions mentioned in this chapter and who follow Krishna's teaching very faithfully without envying Krishna, they become free from all bondage to work. But those who out of envy disregard Krishna's teachings and do not follow them are to be considered as bereft of all knowledge befooled and ruined in their endeavors for perfection. So however nicely somebody may do some activity, ultimately success is possible by following Krishna's directions or Krishna's instructions on karma yoga. <clears throat> At the end of this chapter, Arjuna asks another question from Krishna. And it's a very important question that Arjuna is asking. Arjuna is asking, by what is one driven to sinful acts, even unwillingly, as if engaged by force? Sometimes we may also have experience that we know to do something is wrong. But still, we somehow don't avoid doing that wrong activity. Now, Arjuna is asking, what is that force which sometimes seems to be working against my own interest? That I am forced to commit some sin sometimes? What is that force? So, Krishna's reply is very, very direct and clear. He says, lust is the cause of all sinful activities. This lust, when unsatisfied, turns into anger. And therefore, Krishna describes this lust as the all-devouring sinful enemy of the world. Sinful enemy. It forces us to do sin. And because sin brings in so much of suffering, Therefore, this lust is our greatest enemy. Krishna describes how different people are covered by different degrees of this lust. He gives three examples to help us understand these different degrees of covering. As fire is covered by smoke, as a mirror is covered by dust, or as the embryo is covered by the womb, Every person is similarly covered by different degrees of lust in this world. So nobody is free from lust in this world. It is only a question of the degree of covering. Now, Krishna further describes that originally our consciousness is very pure. There is no covering of lust. But when we take birth in this world, our pure consciousness becomes covered by our eternal enemy in the form of lust. And this lust, which forces us to do something sinful, uh, so that we can secure some enjoyment. This lust can never be satisfied by simply indulging in some sinful activity. It can never be satisfied. Krishna f describes this lust as something which burns like fire. Now this analogy is very significant. Just like if there is a fire, you cannot put out the fire by pouring some fuel into it. You have to pour water on the fire to extinguish the fire. 
not pour some petrol or ghee. Similarly, to extinguish lust or to become free from lust is not possible by trying to satisfy the lusty desire by doing some sinful activity. It will only increase the lust. Sinful activities which are impelled by lust, which are driven by lust, will only increase lusty desires. It is never going to be uh, satisfied or it is never going to be... Uh, uh, you cannot become free from lust by satisfying the desires, lusty desires. So then what is the way to become free from lust? Because it forces us to do sinful activities. So Krishna explains something little more detail about this lust. The senses, the mind and the intelligence are the sitting places of this lust. Now where is lust within the body? It is there in the senses. It is deposited in the senses, the mind and the intelligence. Through them, lust covers the real knowledge of a person and bewilders him. That means through the senses, the mind and the intelligence which are afflicted by this lust, a person becomes completely bereft of real knowledge of his self. Just like you heard in the previous chapter, each one of us is spirit soul, we are not the body. But why is it that everyone thinks I am the body? Why is it that nobody knows that he is spirit soul? That's because the senses, the mind and the intelligence which are sitting places of this lust covers our real knowledge about who we are. And further, it also, this lust also bewilders us to act in so many sinful ways. Therefore, Krishna's advice is, from the very beginning, one should try to curb this lust by sense regulation. What is sense regulation? Whenever the senses demand some enjoyment, you should try to either deny, or if it is not possible to directly deny the senses, at least regulate in a restricted way, one should uh, try to supply some enjoyment to the senses. Hmm? So this regulating the senses is the way to conquer this lust. And in this way, one should uh, slay or destroy this lust, conquer this lust, which is described as a very dangerous enemy. In what way is it dangerous? It is destroyer of our real knowledge and destroyer of the urge for self-realization. When we take birth as human beings, we naturally have the urge for acquiring knowledge and for self-realization. This is a natural urge as a human being. But lust is that which destroys this uh, knowledge and it also kills the urge for self-realization. Now, Lord Krishna describes a hierarchy of the different uh, uh, faculties that we have. He says the working senses are superior to dull matter. It is the senses of action or the working senses which, through which we do any activity like the hands, legs, etc. The working senses are superior to dull matter. The mind is higher than the senses. The intelligence is even higher than the mind. And the soul is higher than the intelligence. So there is a hierarchy. 
in our body. Hmm? The lowest is dull matter. Above dull matter are the senses. Above the senses is the mind, above the mind is the intelligence, above the mind, intelligence is the soul. So, what is the reason why Krishna is describing this hierarchy? He says, knowing oneself to be superior to the senses, mind and intelligence, one should steady the mind by deliberate spiritual intelligence or by devotional service and thus by spiritual strength conquer this enemy known as lust. This is Krishna's um, instruction to conquer lust. What does he say? By deliberate spiritual intelligence or by Krishna consciousness steady the mind because the mind drives the senses. And the senses perform, working senses perform sinful activities. So if we have to restrict the senses from sin, then we have to steady the mind. To steady the mind, we have to, uh, uh, we should uh, develop deliberate spiritual intelligence. Hmm. The spiritual intelligence is possible by practicing Krishna consciousness by performing devotional service. And that way we become spiritually strong to conquer lust. We will not yield to the dictation of the senses or the mind or even the intelligence. We will not be misdirected, misled to do sinful activities by the strength of Krishna consciousness. So that is the uh, end of this chapter. Let's stop here.